To your family in the Lord, may you know the strength of our Lord Jesus to be defeat the power of sin, death, and the devil, to be our champion who holds the field forever. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to you that the battle is yours, that each day that we go to battle against the devil and against his schemes. Lord, we pray that you would lead us to, to follow your paths of righteousness instead, to put aside those evil things, turning to you and knowing your mercies, knowing your forgiveness and knowing your grace. Lord, may you lead us to, to look to, to, to know that the battle has been won and that one day we will join you in eternity. We give thanks to you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, Samuel paints a picture of a battle that's about to begin. It's a battle that's been raging on back and forth, but it's one that has mostly been talk at this point. It's the battle that, between the Philistines and the Israelites. On one side stands Goliath, and just in case you forgot the sheer size of Goliath, let me remind you, Scripture says that he was six cubits and a span tall. Now that might not mean much unless you hear the fact that that's just shy of ten feet. So he was about ten foot tall. He carried a shield that weighed 5,000 5, shekels of bronze. That meant his shield weighed about 125 pounds. He carried a spear that the very end of it, just the end of it, weighed 600 shekels of iron, or about 16 pounds. Goliath was an immense champion. He was the Philistines' champion. He looked at this scrawny guy by the name of David across the way from him. Scripture says that he didn't even carry Saul's armor because of the weight, because of the size of it. He came at Goliath, this young man, although the Bible does say handsome and ruddy, he came at him with, in one hand, a staff, in the other hand, a sling and five stones. Now, if you were to look at this battle from the outside, if you were to go back and look at this battle, without the knowledge you have today, who would you say was going to win that battle? It would be pretty clear, wouldn't it? We'd think it was Goliath. We'd look at Goliath and we'd say, he could pick him up in one hand and shake him to death if he wanted to. He even felt so himself, didn't he? He mocked David. He called David names. He made fun of not only David, but the God of Israel, the true God. But David, the whole time, he had faith in the Lord. In fact, he had so much faith that before the battle even began, he made this amazing statement. The battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's, he said, and he proclaimed that even before he slung the first stone, even before he, the battle began, he knew whose it was. He knew that it was over before it even started. His faith never wavered for a minute because he knew who was on his side. He knew that on his side, he had the God who was able to, to, to create the earth and the heavens with simple words of his mouth. He had the God who could stop a storm from coming in its tracks by just telling it to stop. The God who was able to just display his power and might and bring Pharaoh, the leader of the Egyptians, to his knees. The God who would later decimate sin, death, and the devil. Rising over the grave for the resurrection. David knew who his God was. He knew who his champion was. David didn't come there as the champion of the battle, but he knew that God was his champion. And as he faced off against Goliath, he declared those words, the battle is the Lord's. Now we don't face physical enemies like David did. Well, at least most days we don't. Some of you have faced physical enemies in that way, but most days our enemies are spiritual, aren't they? Most days our enemies are those that we cannot see. And maybe this makes it hard sometimes to take those enemies seriously. I think a lot of Christians are, have deluded themselves into thinking that the devil is simply, well, we talk about him. He's an Old Testament character, a New Testament character, but he's not active today. We live in the modern world today. The devil doesn't have any might today but that's wishful thinking honestly thinking about the devil and thinking of, and thinking that he has lost his power lost his sway in this world that's wishful thinking in truth many christians don't take this battle seriously they come, they they know that temptations out there that sin is out there but there's forgiveness and so they're easy prey they're easy to fall under the devil's whims, his temptations. How many of us find ourselves giving in to temptations without even a fight? 
How many of us find ourselves giving into sin without a second thought until later when we confess it to the Lord? You know, the devil, he wants us to take him, well, he doesn't want us to take him seriously. See, he's sneaky. He's deceptive. He likes to use misdirection. In fact, he doesn't even want us to see him as his en- as enemy. Instead, to see him as someone who's just another being out there who will sometimes help you out if you listen to him. But the truth is, that is a lie, as he is a liar. In fact, listen to the words that Paul used from our epistle this morning. Ephesians 6, Paul wrote, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The, our, our enemy is the devil. Now sometimes he'll use that misdirection, he'll use that lies that we might think that those on earth are our enemies. That those who don't share the same Lutheran or or Christian are our enemies. But the truth is, the devil is using them. He is our only true enemy. But he'll use misdirection because so often he knows we'll underestimate him. So often we'll just assume that he's working out there but maybe not bothering us. But he is. He is constantly working against Christians. Constantly working against the people of God to destroy our faith. To hurt our belief put fear into us and not the kind of fear we need fear of the Lord a fear of him he uses this misdirection and confusion much like well, soldiers use this misdirection you know probably I don't know how many of you studied the revolutionary war and I can't say that I'm a huge history buff but I know there Chris uh, certainly is but you know there was a battle that was a battle that changed the direction or was one of the battles that changed the direction it was called, now called the Battle of Princeton. It happened uh, January 2nd and January 3rd of 1777. And the, this battle, General Washington led the Continental Army against the British troops, and, and he surprised them. See, just a, less than a week earlier, January, or December 25th, 1776, and December 26th, 1776, uh, General Washington had led these the troops against Trenton, and it, he defeated Hessian soldiers in Trenton. That was a big surprise there. But the biggest surprise was yet to come because when he led those continental soldiers hungry and tired and cold against the folks in Princeton, the, the British soldiers, they weren't expecting it. It's interesting because Washington rode out and he was just 30 yards from the enemy when he finally declared that they should march. When the smoke cleared on January 3rd, 1777, the continental soldiers... Only 5,000 men were victorious. Time and again, the British soldiers underestimated those American revolutionaries, those continental soldiers. They underestimated them, their, their desire for freedom. And that's what Satan wants us to do, is underestimate him. Underestimate him and just take this battle as nonchalant. Take this battle as something that will go on despite us. Paul, on the other hand, encourages us to not just lay down, not just take this battle, but to be involved in it. Paul encourages us not only to go to battle, but he even gives us the instructions on how to arm and prepare for battle. He tells us how we might go to battle against Satan every day, and not only that, but be successful in battle. Successful. Now, Satan might lie to you. Satan might tell you that there's no way you're ever going to succeed. That is a lie. Because we know that by the power of God's word, we will have success. By the power of Jesus Christ, we have success because he defeated Satan on the cross once and for all. But Paul gives us this armor because we fight this battle day in and day out and we need to be ready. He gives us the armor starting with that belt of truth that I was telling the kids about. And what better weapon to fight against the devil but that belt of truth to fight against the father of lies. Because so often Satan will use lies. He'll use just small half-truths. Things that lead us just a little bit away. Look at the way that he confronted Jesus when they were up there on that mountain in Matthew chapter 4. He thought that he was going to have Jesus. He kept using Scripture and twisting Scripture here and there. And Jesus called him out because he knew the truth. Satan will lie. But when we have the truth, we can confront those lies. And do you know what happens when you confront lies? When you call out lies in the light, 
it silences the liar. It shuts them up. And that's what, we, when we bring the truth of God's word against Satan's lies, he can say nothing. He is speechless. Jesus warns us, though, he is the father of lies. He is deceptive. Listen to how Jesus refers to him in John 8. And he's referring to the Pharisees. You are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. And does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth within him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character. For he is a liar, and the father of all lies. He is a liar. There is no truth within him. And and so the truth shows his lies for what they are. His lies that we are weak. His lies that we will fail and there's no chance. His lies that we must give in to temptation. The truth of God's word says otherwise. The truth of God's word tells us no. By the power of Christ, we can prevail. But not only do we need that belt of truth, but for that armor, we need to also put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now we look at God's law, and we've talked about God's law here before, and it's not a bad thing. But sometimes in our sinful nature, we look at it that way, don't we? John says, though, just warns us in 1 John, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the very beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. We must put on that breastplate of righteousness because we are going to daily face the attacks of, devil, the, attacks of the devil to go to fall into sin. Did you hear how Paul referred to him? He talked about him as fiery darts. And how many of us know the attacks of temptation every day? We know the attacks that come our way. The attacks to get mad when someone cuts us off in traffic. The attacks that, that to, to, to give in to that old familiar habit that, of talking about someone or, or doing something we know we should not do. And think about your own life. Because you know those fiery arrows, those temptations that come your way, the things that you know you should not do, but you give into, And that is why we need that breastplate of righteousness to defend against those fiery arrows. Because they'll keep coming. He keeps throwing volley after volley. He keeps attacking until we fall. But with that breastplate of righteousness, we have the defense we need. The defense to fight temptation, even when, we are, when we're alone and we think, think no one's watching. The, temp, the protection of the devil who will still attack. That he'll guard us. And we need that breastplate of righteousness because we know that old Adam, that old Eve continues to live on within us. That old Adam, that old Eve, it continues to, to, to rise up and lead us to want to do what's wrong. But when we put on the breastplate of righteousness, when we equip ourselves for battle, We're ready to face those fiery darts. And it's knowing God's law. It's knowing God's word. It's knowing that that we need to be be with him in prayer. And it's preparing. And not only preparing ourselves, but preparing others as well. Preparing those around us, our brother, our, our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Putting on that armor, for helping them put on that armor. Joining together in Bible studies confronting them when we know they're caught in sin, showing them what God's Word says. And that's the next part of the armor that Paul gives us. That's not only meant for brothers and sisters in Christ, but he says to put on those shoes of readiness, the shoes of readiness to proclaim the gospel of peace. Put on those shoes of readiness to, to go out and share the good news of God's Word. Peter talks about this in 1 Peter. I love the way he does, and many of you are familiar with this text. In your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason, for the hope that is within you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Always be prepared to give a defense for that good, hope, that good news, the hope that is within you. Always be prepared to, in the, with the readiness, the shoes to proclaim the gospel. And when we go out there, there's going to be times where people don't listen to us. There's going to be times where we share our faith, where we share the good news of God's word, where we share the truth, and people are going to turn their backs on us, and they're going to laugh at us, and they're going to mock us just like Goliath mocked David. But that doesn't mean we should stop. That doesn't mean that we should stop proclaiming that good news of God's word, sharing that message of hope and salvation. And notice how Peter says we should do it. Don't beat people over the head with it. Don't slap them over the head with the Bible until until uh, until they can't move anymore. 
but do so with gentleness and respect. Show them God's word. Show them the truth of his love. Show them his compassion. Show them his law and his forgiveness. Always be ready to proclaim that good news of God's word. But there's going to be times where you're going to arm up. Where you're going to, you're going to put on that armor. You're going to be ready to go. You're going to start the day in God's word. You're going to start the day in prayer. And, the, and it's going to seem like everything goes the opposite way. You give in to temptation. You get angry at those who hurt you. You respond in ways that you know you shouldn't. There's going to be days where it looks like the world is collapsing around us into sin and decay. Where it feels like the church has lost its meaning. Lost its relevance. And so Paul gives us two more pieces of armor that we need to put on. We need to put on that helmet of salvation. And pick up the shield of faith. See, like I said, those attacks of the the devil, they don't just cause temptation. They lead to fear, disappointment, distrust. They lead us to believe that the battle is not the Lord's, but the battle's lost and that there's no hope left. Even from some Christian pulpits you hear this message that the world is coming to an end and and we're we're all all going to die with it and there's no hope. But I have news for you. When we pick up the shield of faith, when we pull on that helmet of salvation, we remember whose the battle is. And we remember that the battle has already been won. That Christ Jesus declared victory on the cross. That He declared victory over sin. That He did not die without purpose. But He died to save us. And He did not stay in the tomb, but He rose. And He told us there's help. There's help for each day if we go to battle. The psalmist says it in Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Where does your help come from? Where does your help come from when you're tired? When you're weary? When you've given into your sin? Where does your help come from when you, when you feel the battle is going the opposite way? When it's getting particularly bloody and messy and sweaty and ugly? Your hope comes from the Lord. The Lord whose battle it is. The Lord who is maker of heaven and earth. The Lord who will not let your foot slip. Who will not let you slide or fall. The Lord who continues to strengthen you. That is why we pick up the shield of faith and pull on that helmet of salvation. Because we need that constant reminder in battle. We need that constant reassurance that no matter how it seems like it is going here on earth, that we are not losing because it's already been won. What armor would be complete, though, without the offensive weapon, without the sword? The very last weapon, that, the very last part of the armor that Paul tells us to pick up it's that sword, the sword of God's word. The sword that we need not only for our defense, but that sword we need so that we might go on the offense. The sword that we need to combat the lies of Satan. The sword that we need to find the truth. The sword that we need to fight the good fight of faith each and every day that we might march against this battle. That is the sword of God's word. And listen to how the power that, that Jesus ascribes to it. Now Jesus asked the disciples in Matthew chapter 16, who, who do people say that I am? And then he gives them this promise after Simon Peter am- answers correctly. Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered, And blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Did you catch that? Did you catch the promise Jesus gave us? That the gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of hell will not have a chance against us. When we pick up the sword of God's word, when we challenge the lies of Satan, that the, the gates of hell will not, will not prevail. And he, he founds his church on himself, on the truth of himself, on the truth of his word. He founds our church, our belief, our faith on Him where we must found our, found our faith in Jesus Christ alone. 
Because Jesus Christ is our champion. He is the champion who gives us the strength, who gives us the power to drive back the hordes of demons. He gives us the strength and power to drive them back to the gates of hell. He gives us the strength and the power to drive them back into hell that they might not attack, but be left impotent and defenseless. And the battle is the Lord's. He has declared victory. He went down to hell. And he declared victory once and for all. He went down to hell. And he said, no. No further will you go. But these, they are mine. So as you prepare for battle, not just during this Lenten season, but as you prepare for battle every day, I encourage you to take our enemy seriously. I encourage you to keep in mind that he will use whatever means, misdirections, lies to lead you away. But that you are not left defenseless like sheep for the slaughter. But that you have been given the armor of God. That you have been given his sword to fight the good fight of faith. May you also have that reassurance that the battle is the Lord's. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we give thanks to you that you are our champion. Forgive us for those times when we mock your word, when we laugh about what, about the gifts you give us. Strengthen us that we might fight the good fight of faith, that we might take up the sword of, the, of your word and challenge the lies of Satan. Lord, strengthen us that we might go to battle each day but know that on the cross you defeated the devil once and for all. That on the cross you defeated his lies. You defeated death and temptation. That we might one day join you in eternity. May this be the hope. May this be the hope that we are always ready to share. This we pray in Jesus Christ, our champion's name. Amen.